it's particularly um, special for me to address uh, Technori and all of you because I remember not too long ago being in the audience at Technori and listening to these pitches and these keynotes. Now, how many of you are entrepreneurs? Okay, and how many of you want to be entrepreneurs someday, aspiring entrepreneurs? Well, I trust, because I know, I know these guys are probably going to you know, get to well over 100. Some of you will have the honor of presenting uh, to the group uh, in the future. And it's always a special thing when you can address a group uh, where you've been part of the audience. So thank you for that. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try to fit my comments in to 10 or 15 minutes here. So we have time for Q&A and most importantly, uh, the, the pitches uh, tonight. And so I want to tell you a little bit about where Context Media is today, uh, tell you about our story and um, how I came to be an entrepreneur and start Context Media. And then if we have some time, I'll give you my observations on healthcare, uh, since so many of you uh, have um, committed to going into healthcare. I'm meeting a lot of healthcare entrepreneurs in the room. And then I'll give you my thoughts on, on venture. And healthcare and venture don't, off, don't always play well together. Uh, and so I'll, I'll highlight that a little bit. Um, and so Context Media today is one of the world's largest health information companies. Uh, we work with over 10,000 medical centers, physician practices, and health systems to serve actionable health content. And um, we work with 33 of the top 35 global pharmaceutical manufacturers. We uh, work with over 70 content producers, and we've built the company to some scale. Our ambition, because if you're in our office, you're always uh, chasing goals. Uh, some of you are work there, so you know we're always playing from behind. Our ambition is to get to 100,000 medical centers and addresses, which is about half of the total market in the United States in the markets we compete in in the next four years, and then uh, do this globally. And um, that's where we are, we are today. Um, we've doubled in, in revenue and generally in organization every year for the past seven years or so. Um, we started eight years ago. Um, we had a tough time in the beginning. We never ended up raising uh, outside capital. Uh, in retrospect now, that seems like a very terrific thing because it's a profitable business and it's growing. Um, the truth is I tried, like a lot of you are trying. Uh, I just failed, like a lot of you probably won't. Uh, and so we ended up never raising outside capital. We bootstrapped. We made it work. Um, you know, this year we'll do 35 million in EBITDA. We're doing planning for next year. Next year we hope to do over 100 million dollars in EBITDA. So I'm a stickler for profitability and revenue and those sorts of pesky details that uh, are not in season right now. Sometimes um, we also have a personal uh, venture firm, Jumpstart Ventures. Uh, it's a holding company through which we do a lot of direct investing uh, in, in startups. We've done about 45 investments in the last four years. Uh, we're LPs in a lot of great funds here in Chicago and also on the coasts. And, and are, you know, trying to you know, do our part to uh, invest in the Chicago ecosystem, which is night and day from when we started in 2006 and 2007. Um, and uh, I've got to say, Technori has been one of these things that's been consistent, you know, 47. And that's, that's really amazing. And it's awesome to have, you know, 500 plus of you interested, uh, sober and interested in hearing startup pitches. It means so much. I still remember, you know, the early pitches like this. We did Tech Cocktail. We did a few other things. And they mean a, the world to entrepreneurs. And so I want to thank you for doing that as well. Um, it's really, really terrific to see. So. You know, my, my entrepreneurial story started very early. You know, I, I um, had an affinity for selling things and building things and giving my parents gray hair uh, along the way since I was probably five or six years old. Um, lots of little adventures. You know, I, I remember around that age, we had a art peddler come to our home. And he tried to sell some artwork to my parents. It was a cold call. He just knocked on the door. Um, 
you know, they're first generation immigrants, so not a lot of cold calls resulted in sales. Uh, and, and so I, I watched this happen, and um, I, I, I realized, wow, this is a thing. I can draw, and I can go knock on doors, and there's some non-zero probability I'll get cash by doing this. And so the next morning, I got my watercolor set. Now, I'm not very artistic, um, but I got my watercolor set out, and uh, uh, before it would dry, I went out and started knocking on doors, trying to sell my artwork. And of course, some of these neighbors knew me, and so they bought artwork, and I saw this as product market fit. Um, <laughs> and so I started doing more and more of this. And then they phoned uh, my parents, who were at work. Uh, so they had my, my grandma, who was living with us, uh, wearing a sari, for some of you who know what that is. Uh, she was from India and just moved there. And, and she starts kind of chasing me, and she can barely move. Uh, and so this is a very funny adventure. I got a, I got a big uh, talk that night about why not to do this. And uh, I actually relented for once. Uh, so that might have been my actual first. I don't think I sold anything before I was six. Um, but these got more serious over time. So I won't spend all my time talking about this. But as I, as I look back, um, there were three experiences in particular before <laughs> context media. And some of them were unconventional, were things that uh, weren't directly businesses that really, I think, um, were formative for me and, and gave me some of the strengths I needed to uh, take on starting a company and, and scaling it. So I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit. The first was trading, which is timely given the last few days. So I was 12 years old when I started uh, really trading more than investing, I would say, at that point. I, I don't trade now, but, but you know, at the time, my, I didn't start out trading. I, I started out just helping my dad use the computer. That's how it started. And so I was 12, it was 1998. My dad um, is a better doctor than an investor, but, but he liked to invest. And um, he um, asked me for help uh, putting some stock orders in online. Online investing and trading was just coming around. And to me, this looked like the coolest thing ever, right? That tells you a little bit about me. Maybe I'm a, I'm a pretty big geek, but, but um, I like to frame it differently. But uh, you know, this looked like using numbers and computers to make money. And it looked like you could do something important uh, despite your age. And so I, I really got obsessed with investing. <laughs> and I read everything I could about the stock market. I read about you know, value investing, fundamental analysis, um, a lot of the technical stuff, all, everything I could get my hands on. I read hundreds of books in the next kind of couple months. I got really obsessed with it. And <clears throat> I ended up becoming very active. And I discovered, this probably won't mean much to 90% of you, but I discovered that certain derivatives, right, really these were just option contracts at first, traded out of sequence with each other around volatility. So when something would erratically move up and down, uh, this is the late 90s before a lot of automated trading it, you know, really came in, certain out of the money, low volume derivatives would trade out of sequence. And so I set up a very basic strategy and program to identify these mispricings. And I started trading them. Now, mind you, I'm in junior high, OK? Uh, so I'm in junior high. I um, convinced my parents to let me uh, take over an account in their name. And um, I, I persuaded them to do this over time. And I, I become basically a full-on trader. And I've got multiple monitors going up. And I, I, I you know, you can imagine after I got some success, uh, I, I, I was rebellious to begin with. I really just wanted to stop going to school. I questioned my teachers even more. I was kind of a problem kid at school. And I would just leave and um, start trading. And, and I, you know, I felt like I could do anything. Uh, and so I actually, this is a funny story, it comes full circle. I had research in motion mobile devices before they made phones. Because they had all sorts of commercial devices, trading devices and things like that. So I had these things. And I'd be trading in school, and they'd confiscate them because, you know, back then cell phones in schools, I don't know how that is now, but, but it wasn't a thing. And, and, and then I have backups in, in my locker. Uh, so it really became a, a, a whole story. But, you know, the things I learned um, in that experience is really managing uncertainty, managing volatility, and becoming calmer in the face of change and crisis. 
This is really tough to do. It's tough to fake, right? Because there are times, no matter how great you are as an entrepreneur, how good your idea is, that something shakes you, right? There's really an existential crisis in your business. And it doesn't just happen early. It happens early, it happens often. And um, the way you instinctually react to change really makes a difference to your team, all right? It makes a difference in your own ability to process it. And um, I credit a lot of this experience to trading. And the other thing about trading that was neat for me in my, my experience was you know, the, the importance of clarity, right? It's really easy to kind of um, sound smart. You know, the old joke about the economist on one hand, on the other hand, well, which hand's right? You know, what, what do you believe? Um, and, and, and um, you know, trading really f forces you to have a point of view, right? And that's very, very important because as you get into the industry, uh, especially in healthcare, you hear so much talk about everything. As, a, as an entrepreneur, you really have to have a focused point of view, right? You know, you can't run a hundred businesses at the same time. You have to pick one and you have to have a point of view that you really commit to. And, and that's important. And you really have to have intellectual honesty about tracking, tracking that. The second one is going to be very different from training. It was politics, right? Uh, all sorts of inefficiencies uh, in, in, in politics. And so um, I, I really had a bunch of interests growing up. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time in school. Um, I basically almost didn't graduate high school, which is a, um, kind of a funny story that didn't seem as funny at the time. Uh, there's a law that you have to go to school for a certain percentage of the days, and I was just a tiny bit short of that number of days. Uh, so they almost didn't graduate me, but I, I worked that out. And so my senior year of high school, I spent it in Iowa. I worked on, you know, now, now Secretary Kerry's presidential campaign. So I was working in Iowa, then I went to Ohio, and um, so many lessons, right? I look for people from this background now along with the other background because there, there, there is so much uh, kinship that, that you have to entrepreneurship. Um, we often had to make decisions, right? We had to win, but we had no idea what our budget was going to be. We had no idea what the environment was going to be the next day. And little things, the closer you get to execution and to a binary win or loss, you start paying attention to the details, right? It's not the big picture strategy stuff you realize that matters. You all have good strategies. It's how you execute day in and day out and beat your competitors around the details. And there's, you know, nowhere this is more apparent than the caucus process, uh, if any of you have, have spent time uh, in, in, that, in that process. So I got a ton of experience there. And I was a high school senior, and I made the very strange decision to support Secretary Kerry at that time. He didn't have a lot of supporters uh, at that time. He was like number four in <coughs> Iowa. Everybody cool was um, supporting Howard Dean and a couple of the others. And so I got pretty senior in this campaign. And by the general, I had people who were much more senior. You know, I had a Yale Law School grad working for me, and I was a senior in high school. And so uh, uh, this process tends to repeat yourself, right? Because, you, you know, and so all sorts of very interesting experiences. Um, but you really learn the value of decision making with limited data and of execution ground level tactical execution. Um, of course we lost and I got kind of depressed. Right? It's sort of like your, your, you know, your first venture, which this was almost, uh, I felt like my first venture, although it wasn't my first political venture. You, you, know, you almost get heartbroken. Right? It's like a really bad breakup. You just want to withdraw. And so I, withdraw, I withdrew and I went into school and I, I loved school for the first time. It didn't last long, uh, but I, I went out east, I went to college, I deferred admission. And um, I went to college. And you know, for the first time, I was really excited about school. And I had a professor who really changed my point of view and introduced me to venture-backed companies and entrepreneurship right? and that, that framework. I had started things since I was little, but I, did, I still thought, boy, I really want to go into strategy consulting, and then business school, and then venture capital, and then I'll go start a company. And this professor uh, and I had, had you know, become close, and he just said, your plan is stupid, and, and here's why. Here's your proficiency curve, and here's your risk curve. You know, you're, you're going to be a little bit more pr proficient at starting a company then, but you probably won't actually start it because your risk profile will totally change. It was a, a, a simple point, but it, was, it really struck a chord with me. And so 
Long story short, he didn't mean for me to drop out. He was just trying to encourage me to go <laughs> look at early stage opportunities. Uh, but um, I moved fast, and I, I dropped out. And uh, I, I came back to start a company. And I was interested at that time, it was 2005, in mobile media. Okay, now mobile sounds like it's just everything now, right? You don't even have to say mobile, everything's on mobile. Uh, but at that time, uh, it wasn't like that. I loved mobile early on. I had, I think, the first iPad. I was, again, doing all this trading and all this stuff, and I just fell in love with mobile devices. And this is before the iPhone, and so, you know, I thought, boy, we have more computing power in people's pockets than, you know, we did to put a man on the moon. It's amazing how underutilized these things are, and particularly around media, which was always my passion. You know, what if we could serve information to people on their mobile device? So it was contextual and location-based, and it could really help them live better lives and make more informed decisions and, and a bunch of other things. So I was kind of flirting with this idea. Um, it was really tough to get off the ground. Sometimes I think I should have stuck with it because it was a really big idea. Uh, and a lot more possible after mobile phones took off and you had the Android ecosystem and the iOS ecosystem and so much location-based data. Uh, but anyway, you know, it didn't really work out and uh, my parents said, you know, you've given us a lot of great hair uh, and we've supported you, but you really should graduate college. Uh, so I gave it another shot and, and I went back to school. I went to Northwestern actually and I was there one full-time quarter before I dropped out again. Uh, but it was a great quarter. It was a really wonderful quarter. Um, and, uh, uh, and so at Northwestern, in the second week, I met a professor, um, any of you from Northwestern recent grads, I met a professor named Mark Witte. Uh, and so Mark Witte actually uh, grabbed me after we had talked and said, I have to introduce you to somebody. And that became you know, one of my co-founders in Context Media, and he in turn introduced me to our other co-founder in Context Media, Shraddha, who has previously addressed Technori. And so um, we met, and we started a student-run organization right away. Now, it wasn't a normal student-run organization. It was kind of the student-run organization to end all student-run organizations. Uh, in that one quarter, in the ensuing kind of two quarters, uh, even after I dropped out, we built this thing up to run 12 student-run companies. And it's now spun off a portfolio of student-run companies similar to uh, Harvard student agencies. Um, it ran a magazine that was distributed internationally and had contributors all over the world. It ran a consulting group that did consulting work for local Northwestern businesses. It ran a finance group that uh, traded real dollars and now a sliver of Northwestern's endowment uh, and all sorts of other fun things. And very quickly, we got to hundreds of people. And this might have been the most difficult thing um, I've ever done. Managing hundreds of people of the same age without being able to compensate them um, is really hard. <laughs> and it makes uh, running a startup where you can actually pay people, albeit not a lot, a lot easier. Uh, and so uh, uh, this was an incredible, incredible experience. I could go on about it for so long. But we've actually recruited uh, now two of the past presidents of this organization uh, into, into our company, and they're, they're terrific leaders. And many of these student-run organizations, I think, are just a great bed of um, finding great entrepreneurial leaders because you operate with a lot of the same environmental hazards uh, that you face in entrepreneurship, uh, especially motivating people, right, around a purpose. That's one of the real advantages of a mission-based business, right? You can absolutely go get great talent because you pay them a lot, but your competitors might figure that out and then you know, drive up you know, labor and so on and so forth. There are tons of things you can do like this to get little, little tricks. Something that's really tough to replicate is when you have an organization where hundreds or thousands of people come to work to make something happen that they view as intrinsically valuable. right? And, and the company can and should still make a lot of money, but having this purpose-based organization is an incredible sustainable organization. This was the, fo the focus of the magazine we started at, um, at Northwestern, and really something I learned from, from starting this, this student group. And so I had this idea about mobile and actionable information in mind. Uh, I was thinking about it in terms of serving information on phones or, or mobile devices. 
And we chanced upon an article in The Economist in late 2005, <coughs> which gave us the first inkling of an idea for context media. And it was about how retailers were putting up digital displays to serve information to consumers uh, at you know, the place where they were actually making product decisions and buying things. Procter & Gamble was calling this the moment of truth. And um, it instantly struck a chord. The idea of serving information right where consumers are making a decision uh, in a contextual and targeted way is exactly what I wanted to do in mobile and didn't have the underlying infrastructure and ecosystem to do. And so we went out using our student magazine uh, to get free media passes uh, to New York to a conference and um, looked at the space. And it was a real cowboy space. And, and I mean, you know, you had the uh, traditional billboard operators in this space. It was called digital place-based media or digital signage. Um, you had those really annoying things. This company's gone bankrupt, fortunately, since then. But if you remember in malls for like 18 months or so, you had large screens on the floor and you'd walk on it and it would move and make noises. It was really cool for the first 25 seconds, but after that you realized it probably cost a lot and had no value. Uh, and so those guys were big at the time. You had all sorts of these digital media companies. And so we looked at all this and we thought, boy, this is, this is great technology, um, but where could it add the most value? And we had a moment, a eureka moment, where we thought healthcare. Now, that may sound like a strange leap, uh, but I have a, a personal history of family with, with um, diabetes and other healthcare conditions, as did my, my co-founders. And I, I had gone through this just growing up. I had no interest in going into healthcare as a provider uh, ever, uh, and didn't really think I wanted to do a business in healthcare. I was more interested in tech and media. But it's funny how these things come full circle. And so um, I, I saw this technology and thought, boy, you know, if you have a chronic condition, right? Something like diabetes or heart disease or, you know, imagine uh, having cancer or any number of conditions. You spend often less than one hour of actual face time a year with your doctor. And during that hour, right, maybe three, four, five, six, ten minute appointments, fifteen minute appointments, during that hour, you make decisions that affect, you know, you during the 525,600 minutes during the course of that year how you feel, right, the quality of your life. Uh, they're immensely dense decisions, right? The density of decision making is extraordinary in healthcare. That's why change is so hard as well. But you have incredible density in decision making. So we thought, okay, you know, it seems like it's so hard to make a change in healthcare. But if you actually look at healthcare and the progression of chronic disease, which is where all the cost is, right? 80% of cost is often, we, we know, in chronic. Well, chronic isn't a bunch of long tail stuff. It's a dozen to two dozen things we really know and understand and generally have treatments for. Uh, and, and, and we know that the cost is in the complications or non-treatment of, of these chronic conditions. Why can't we do anything? Right? It's really behavior change. And so we look at how can we do something about it. And, and, and we thought if we show up in an impactful way at the point of care where all these interactions are happening, we really had a good shot of bringing information to consumers and really making sure that we convert properly when we want to get consumers on therapy and keep them on therapy. Now, this doesn't address prevention of chronic, right, which is a very important thing to do. This addresses more consumers who have a chronic condition where cost is and how we can improve their health outcomes. And so we had a simple idea. We wanted to show up with video. We wanted to show up with content in a digital way. And so we started, we started doing this, and we met a ton of obstacles along the way. Right? Of course, the provider said, we love what you're doing, and then we asked them to pay. And they said, well, we love what you're doing, uh, but we can't pay you because we're reimbursed for seeing patients. We're not really paid for education. right? And for the folks that, that are paid for education, they, we've got so much fragmentation of health insurers that it was very difficult to line up the populations we could actually help with the payers that would benefit from the improved outcomes. So that was, that was you know, we realized quickly, not a good monetization uh, stream. So then we went to pharma, and we said, look, you've got a huge vested interest here, right? Pharma spends $5 billion a year uh, on DTC advertising, $33 billion a year, this is just in the United States, not globally, $33 billion a year uh, marketing its products to both uh, consumers and healthcare professionals. And we thought, 
look, uh, in order to really improve outcomes, we've got to get patients on therapy, and we've got to keep them on therapy. Right? These are people who have a condition. Something like 3% of people who ought to be on cholesterol medication are actually compliant with their cholesterol medication. I mean, that's astounding, but it kind of makes sense because the cost to the user or the consumer is 20, 30 years later, right? And the inconvenience is daily. And so it's, it's set up with an incentive structure, right? Given our, our habits and behaviors as human beings. So we, we thought we'd go to pharma and we'd go to medical device companies and health brands and get them to really use our networks to promote their products instead of going on television or running magazine ads in mass media or all those sorts of things. And ultimately that ended up working, but it took us two years. Our, one of our big customers now um, that's done you know, over $50 million with us, in the first year and a half, um, I made 21 calls and left 21 voicemails without a call return from this customer. And the 22nd call went great. But I just go to, you know, I, I say that to show you how difficult it was to just get time with some of these manufacturers and the war stories that are common, even, in, even with successful startups. And even once we got in the door, right, which took over a year, getting them to really build a line item for around us was really, really tough. And you see this a lot in healthcare. You often will meet with payers or you'll meet with providers and they'll nod and say, boy, this is a great idea. Somebody around here should buy this. And then you'll say, well, who? Say, I don't know. I don't know who's got that budget. And often, if you're really innovating, nobody has your budget. It doesn't exist. And so we ran into a lot of that. All right, they would all say, oh, this, you should buy this. Go talk to the advertising agency. The advertising agency would send us back to the client. The client would send us to the innovation team. And you just run in circles. And, and so you know, it was really a process to get on. And then once we got on, it was really a process to build a line item and build an industry. Right now, there are conferences uh, dedicated to what we sell. There are agencies that are built around this type of media, uh, but that takes years and years and years. So there were a lot of lot of pitfalls along the way, and I've summarized, you know, looking back at those seven or eight years, you know, four things, five if we have time here, uh, that I would I would leave you with as observations and, and advice. So the first is focus. Uh, now. Focus sounds like generic advice, right? But it's the most important thing I can, I can leave you with, if there's one piece of advice that I can give you. And I'll tell you what I mean by focus. So you need to, based on the stage of your business, pick an interval. It might be a month from now, a week from now. In my case, it's usually a year from now. You know, As we get bigger, maybe it's two or three years from now. You need to pick an interval. And you need to build a picture of what you're driving towards. It needs to be very, very specific. And you know, being partly delusional, you've got to then get one leg in that world and say, OK, I believe this world exists. right? I can see it. I can visualize it. I can touch it. And then you've got to really understand what are the existential threats to that world existing. Right? And this gets harder as you go on. Because my, my first piece of advice here on focus is hold the existential threat in your hands. So in our business, we saw early on that the existential threat, right, the thing that would kill us if we were going to die in 2008 or 2007, was that we could not sell advertising to monetize the footprint. We saw that we could build supply, and we had a really tough time doing that. And so I wanted to own it. Not because you know, I could necessarily solve it, but if we were going to go down as a founder, you want to go down owning what killed you. You don't want to go down with a bullet that you don't see coming at you. right? You want a chance to fight that enemy. And too often, you see entrepreneurs who have a product, and their issue is they can't sell it, and they spend 80% of their time making the product better. Now, if you can't sell it because you have a deficiency in your product, that makes a lot of sense. But if it's not, then you've got to fight on the front that, that is fighting you. And so I hope that makes sense. But, but you know, you've really got to understand in the beginning what is the existential threat attacking you, right? Because it's not, it's not, you can't take for granted that you're going to exist. That alone is a privilege. And, so, and, and you've got to burn. And so 
You've got to really quickly understand what can get me. And you've got to spend your time and your energy, your imagination and creativity fighting that in a very focused way. At any point in time, there are three things that should get 80 or 90% of your attention. And that doesn't really change that much as you, as you scale. Right? And so this kind of focused uh, impact and engagement is so important. And it gets harder and harder and harder in the world we live in because things can pull you all over. And it's having the judgment to know where is it that I have the existential threat. Or as you grow and you don't have an existential threat, where is it where I can 10x or 100x my business? And so that's, that's really, really important. And in later years, it's not so much the existential threat. That was a big turning point for me. right? Right after we got out of the early years, you know, time should have been great. I should have been really happy. And I was for about a year. But then I was like, hmm, this is interesting. Nothing seems like it's around the corner, about to lurk out and get us. Um, now what? And you've really got to force yourself at that point to envision what you want to get to and, and go through the same process. And so it's this sort of focused vision and then, and then fight against the, the threat to it. The second is being dynamic. So what values are important to you? What, what achievements are important to you? What objectives are important to you? You've got to define those, and those stay consistent. But your actual vision, the, in the way that I talked about vision, the strategies you use, the tactics you have, they're going to change. And we were talking a lot about culture. And I was out with our um, July hires. So we had a class of new hires. And one of them said, boy, um, I'm really, I didn't say, boy, that's something I said. Uh, they, they simply asked, um, how do we make sure that we retain culture, even though we're growing so fast? And um, it was a great question. It's a, it's a question I, I think about a lot. And, and the answer is different every six months, to be honest with you, as the answer to most things are. How do we sell more? How do we make our product more? And so it's really about fixing the questions, but then embracing dynamic answers. And that's a very, very helpful discipline, right? Where, where you, can, you can actually say, you know, here are the questions I'm going to ask myself, but I'm going to write answers from scratch each time and really track how I'm, how I'm doing. So that's become a very helpful, helpful practice. Um, team, right? You can't underestimate team. That just because you're small or you give stock options to people or, you know, you, you do some startup things, you've maybe got, you know, lunch in the office or something, you're going to have great culture. Right? You really can't buy culture. Culture comes from people feeling like they're in unison going against a shared objective or goal. Right? And then it's the way you allocate resources. It's all sorts of other things that play off of that. And what gets really critical around team and culture in particular is alignment. Right? It's OK that everybody's doing their own thing, but you've got to make sure you have shared alignment. And this is a, this is a topic that um, we struggled with early on, that we had to go through some, some pain points to fix and really address, that you see almost every startup uh, uh, go through and kind of waste a year or two on. Right? In retrospect, when you look back at five or six years, you think, could have gotten here much sooner had we really paid attention to team as we go from five people to 25 people or 25 people to 50 people. How do we really ensure that everybody is working towards the same shared objective? And, and, and that becomes a critical thing. And, and, and the last one I'll say is you know, measurement. So this is really important in healthcare. Healthcare is so tough for so many reasons, but one of the gifts you have in healthcare is it's very data rich. You have claims data to work with. You've got prescription data to work with. You've got you know, reimbursement data. You have so much data everywhere you look. And rather than staying um, tactical in how you measure value that you create, I would encourage you to figure out if you sell into enterprises, how do you actually generate income for the, the enterprise? Right? So, so how do you save them money, or how do you make them money? Because the point at which you can measure how you save an enterprise, whether it's a payer or a provider, how you save them money or make them more money, the discussion totally turns. Right? You're actually selling value or selling measured you know, income to them rather than selling an idea. And it, it takes so much of the friction away, especially when you're innovating. Right? If, you're, if you're selling something in a mature industry, people will give you a lot of slack, even if there's not much measurement around it. And you can get away with better, faster, cheaper arguments. But when you're selling something that hasn't been sold before, right, that's true innovation, it is especially critical to measure 
in specific and defensible ways the value that you're adding. And it's very tough to get to. It requires a lot of creativity. But in healthcare, it's very viable. Almost everywhere you look in healthcare, you have the means and the, the data availability to actually measure the exact value. And if you can't measure the value, right, question what you're doing. Right? If you can't demonstrate that you can actually improve outcomes, reduce claims, you know, whatever it is that you, 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 you want to be doing, um, are you doing it? Because you will be, you will be called out on it as you, as you attempt to scale. So, you know, a couple of notes outside of, of CM even around, um, around healthcare that um, are, are, are really important and, and I wish I understood fully when I was starting. <laughs> One is when you look at consumer companies, right, which investors often will compare you to, or you look at enterprise software companies, it's very easy to underestimate how much distribution and sales matters in healthcare. Healthcare is not set up to buy the best product. You know, payers and providers are so fragmented that they're biased towards legacy. Their processes around procuring the best available product simply isn't what it is in enterprise or certainly not in consumer, where switching costs are really low. It's hard to change in healthcare. And so legacy has an advantage that's very difficult for people to understand. And so just relying on a channel to gain distribution or relying on marketing to gain distribution is one of the very easy ways to, to fail and to read from that, from a lack of traction, that there is an underlying demand for what it is that you actually sell or make. And it's, it's one of the most frequent misses or mistakes that I see from healthcare entrepreneurs. So, you know, the, the first thing I, I, I tell you is really understand that distribution and sales really matters. The second is almost every successful health tech model that you see has multiple stakeholders. So you don't usually have one customer, right? You've got a three-legged stool or a four-legged stool where you've got to get multiple actors and stakeholders to work together. And that's why these models are so hard to replace. But it's also what gives them a moat or a very strong competitive advantage. So think through that very clearly because if what you sell works very well for a hospital but doesn't work for a payer or works really well for a payer but not a hospital, it's going to be really tough to get any traction. And you can really spend time uh, going in circles. So that's, that's critical. And you know, the, the, the last one, this is just an area that's outside CM that you're seeing, is by having EHRs, you're now seeing a wave of automation around tasks. So these might be inpatient engagement. They actually may be on the medical side. But you're just seeing a wave of technology-enabled tasks being done. And it's, it's happening very fast. And it's really changing the, the practice of medicine. For the first time, really, uh, uh, I've said in the last 12 to 18 months, and you're seeing a wave of these things come out. Almost every, every month or two, uh, there's, there's new traction there, and new companies getting funded. Um, so I, I, I hope this has been helpful to you. I'm happy to take some uh, questions from the, the audience here, and we'll kick it over to, to our Q&A with Seth.